37 mighty men of David. That's 37 points. You know that, don't you? I'm not getting very far today, so don't worry. We're just going to actually it'll probably take a couple of weeks to get through this list, and so we will start there. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the way that you have already been working in my heart in relationship to this word. I also thank you, Father, for the, the many ways this week that you have shown me this word to be true. You've done that in a couple of ways, Father. You showed it to me to be true by the evidence of when your people choose to be mighty. But you also have shown me, Lord God, sadly, the evidence of what it looks like when your people choose not to be mighty. Father, I pray that this word will be a strong word like a sword. For some, it would, it would pierce and come out like a prod in their back, spurring them to greater service. For others, Lord God, may it be a word that says, stay faithful, stay the course, keep on going, be just like you are supposed to be. And so, Father, I pray that it will fall upon the hearts and ears of those the way you desire and that your Holy Spirit will bring the results. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, several of you asked me about the rope from last week's sermon. Some of you weren't able to be here because of sickness and you heard it online and, or you saw it on our, on our church's site. There's some little pieces of rope at the, at the very back in that box back there for those of you that wanted a piece of the rope. I also appreciate all of you that sent me pictures of you holding, holding the rope and little text saying, I'm holding the rope. And also the other people that sent me text letting me know that you're holding the rope for someone that you love and you just wanted me to join you. Put my hands on that rope with you as you're holding that rope for others. And so that message is out there on the church's site and if you need the rope, it's back in the back. How long are you supposed to carry these? Till April 15th. That's right. April 15th. This is my second one. I think the first one got washed. And so... I may have to take that box home with me before it's all over what's left. All right. So let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 1 through 12. A call to be mighty. I want you to look at the way this, this, this text, this, this begins. It says, now these are the last words of David. These are the last words of David. What would your last words be? I got a feeling that these probably wouldn't be my last words. In fact, when I think about all the things that David wrote, all of the Psalms and, and other things that David said and, and wrote, I got a feeling that I would have thought, well, maybe this would be, you know, I can think of some Psalms. I would like to have my last word. But these are the last words of David. And that's, I think, sometimes what is um, interesting to me is not only the, the word that is inspired but the order that is inspired. And I think it's interesting that the last words of David is immediately followed by the great men that David had in his life. They're not found any other. They're not, this is where they're supposed to be. It's at the very end. <laughs> David would have had 37 pallbearers. 37 mighty men. So here's his last words. David, the son of Jesse. Thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. The spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just or righteous, ruling in the fear of God. 
And he shall be like the light of the morning when the sun rises, and morning without clouds. Like the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after, by clear shining after rain. Although, although my house is not so with God, yet he has made me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. For this is all my salvation and all my desire. Will he not make it increase? But the sons of rebellion shall all be as thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken with hands. But the man who touches them must be armed with iron and the shaft of a spear and they shall be utterly burned with fire in their place. So let's first of all, before we go into the rest of the verses and go into the mighty man, let's talk about, a, about, about, about these first seven verses, about the last words of David. And what I phrase here is, a man who rules mightily. And would you would agree that David has plenty of flaws and makes plenty of mistakes, but David ruled mightily. He ruled mightily. And David lists six things in these seven verses that he knew at the very end of his life, he knew that the reason he was able to rule mightily was because he, he knew these things. He knew them from the time before he even faced the Goliath. He knew those when he faced the lion and the bear. But he, they had become part of who he was when he gets to this place. So what does a man who rules mightily know? A rule, man who rules mightily knows that God is the cause. Look at verse 1. Thus says David, the son of Jesse, thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of the God of, the God of Jacob and the so sweet psalmist of Israel. In other words, he declares that he knows the reason why he was able to rule mightily. No husband nor wife is able to end well who fails to realize that they can't do anything without God. He ruled mightily because he knew who God was and what God wanted to do in his life. He knew that he ended well because God brought it about. The second thing, he, knew, he knows that God speaks in order to lead. Verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. I've said this, not, I've said it here. But I haven't said it enough here for you guys to remember it. When I was with the convention and I was doing conferences, this was a common phrase. I would usually begin every session before I would talk with this particular phrase. God is not a, God is not a Baptist preacher. He doesn't talk because he wants to be heard. God never speaks for information purposes. God always speaks for transformational purposes. And that is true. God does not speak so you know more. That seems to be a, a Christian thing. Generally more women than men. And I'll tell you why. Men don't like to sit. So they're not, when they go to a conference, they might go to one conference a year. If they do, usually one every five or six years. But now women, women who become addicted to conferences will go to conferences after conferences. They will have their notebooks and their pads. They will fill them up all the way through the conference. They will go home, set it aside, get another conference, had a paper for the next conference and all they do is have more information but not much transformation and being one who did 13 years of everyday conference after conferences I saw a lot of the same women over and over again with different notepads and they would ask me the same questions God doesn't want you to know more he wants you to follow more do you understand that? God, doesn't, God is not concerned about how much you know, but you need to own this. The more you know, the more he holds you accountable for. You are able to rule mightily when you know that when God speaks to you, he expects you to follow. Boy, I'm not careful. I'm going to go take out a lot of garbage dumping right now, and I don't want to do that, but I'm just telling you. He 
Men, stop talking about what you know. Start living what you know. Women, stop talking about what you know and start living what you know. I'll give you an example. How dare you talk about all that God has done for you to save you and then to constantly wallow. Constantly wallow like a hog that have returned to the deeps of that muddy pit because you know that he has forgiven you but you can't just seem to forgive yourself you're never going to live mightily when God speaks he speaks in order to lead you which means he speaks to where you are so he can take you where he wants you to go. Stop staying where you are. You will be held accountable for the much you know, much more is required. One who rules mightily, one who lives mightily, knows that knows it is only because of God. And they know that it is because God speaks. Now what does, when God speaks, he leads? So that leads us to the third verse. He knows that to rule rightly, he must do fearfully. Verse 3. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over me must, over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. As a husband, I am to act rightly, not in the fear of my wife, not in the fear of the other options that could happen. But in a fear, a sense of fear and trembling and respect of my God. David was able to rule mightily because he knew who his God was and who God is. And he knew that, that God spoke to him in order to lead him. And he knew that when God spoke to him that he was to do right what God asked him to do. And with no exceptions, no dirtiness, no gray, he was to do exactly what God called for him to do. And he was to do it with awareness of his frailty in the midst of a great God which should cause trembling. How do you lead your family? How are you leading your family? Fourth, he knows that God makes him shine. And he shall be like the light of the morning when the sun rises and morning, a morning without clouds. That was like this morning. I don't know whether there was any clouds, but it was a very different morning than yesterday morning. Would you not agree? Like the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after grain. <laughs> my pasture has been just barely surviving with all of my cows on it. But this morning when I went out in the brightness of the sun, very different day. Yesterday my hillside had springs pouring out. I mean, some uh, five, I saw a five-gallon bucket. I could have stuck the whole bucket down the hole. It was never there before. It was coming out of the hillside. Water was just gushing out of that yesterday. And there was that, like that all down that 111 acres. There were springs everywhere coming out every hillside. The water had to come out somewhere. I found caves yesterday on my property I didn't even know I had. Because there was like waterfalls, like somebody, waterfalls, like somebody had cut off the uh, uh, fire hydrant in New York City and it was just gushing out. Well, with all that water yesterday and the sun comes out this morning, I walk out because I had two new calves born in, her, in the midst of that rainstorm. And I go out to check on them this morning, and that field, that pasture that was just surviving was dark, dark green. <laughs> Literally glistening in the sunlight. Every blade of grass was just shining. Now, how do you get there? Is that because of the rain? 
How do you have children like that? How do you end up having a marriage like that? How do we end up having a church like that? Well, you know that God is the cause that he desires to speak in order for us to follow. And when we follow, we do exactly what he says rightly, and we do it with fear and understanding of who he is. And when we do that, God makes us shine. He makes relationships shine. Do not expect your relationship, whether married or unmarried, to shine when you're bringing darkness into it. Do not expect it to glisten on a sunny day if you're bringing darkness in it. Do not expect God to pour out his favor on you when you've already decided that you are not going to follow him when he speaks. He'll grant security to us in those times. Although my house is not so with God, yet he has made me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. Again, we're back to the first part. God does that. You know that you're only secure in following him. Well, the man that rules mightily knows those five things, but he also knows the truth found in verses 6 and 7. The sons of rebellion shall, not, shall all be as thorns thrust away. Verse 7, they're not only going to be thrust away, they will be burnt in the fire. Sounds very similar to some of the things that Jesus said in, in his ministry. For because they cannot be taken with hands but the man who touches them must be armed with iron and the shaft of a spear that's very important in verse 8 by the way and they shall be utterly burned with fire in their place you see a man who rules mightily knows how to do battle with thorns Now, it is after that verse that he's going to spend the rest of this chapter talking about 37 men out of thousands of soldiers who were mighty. Who knew how to do battle against thorns. You understand why now this list appears? The order is just as divine and inspired as the wording. God says, I'm going to give, I'm going to, all right now, we're going to record David's last words, and when we're done, we're going to give evidence of 37 men who ruled mightily. We're not, so the, the, the list now is 38. You have seven verses on David and then he's going to so what's the second point I really don't like my second point that's up there I'm going to tell you what the second point is Here, it's very hard for a man to rule mightily alone it is very hard for a woman to rule mightily alone it is very hard for anyone to rule mightily alone. You not only need God, but you need the gifts that he gives you. And one of the gifts he gives us are other people who have the same kind of heart and the same kind of desire to follow God who they want to shine to. They, want to, they don't just want to end well. They want to live well. You know, our family shares around... Well, usually in the middle, of, sometime in December, Trish will start sending out texts asking, what's your it prayer? What's your it prayer for each year? And several years ago, my it prayer was, pray that I end well. That was a terrible, terrible prayer for a year. It really was. Well, at the time, I thought it was pretty good. I want to end well. 
I want to end well. But as that year went along, God kept saying, so, so if you're going to end well, you better be living well. And your prayer is not about the end. Your prayer ought to be about every day. You ought to be more concerned about what you're going to do today, what you're going to do right now in this moment. Because you understand to live well today, I must live well every moment and decision I make. You see, that's where we make a mistake. We just want to end the day well. Well, you're never going to get there until you realize that every moment you're at a crossroads. Every moment. Some crossroads are real easy to see, are they not? I think those major crossroads, yeah, it's, they can define us. But you understand the reason why those major crossroads define us? is because we messed up on all the other ones that we didn't see. So let's look at the first man. Now, I practice. Trish will tell you. Where is she? Over there. She keeps moving on me. She's over there today. She has heard me pronounce these names over and over again. I've gone to my Siri and said, how, and type, because I can't say it, so I can't say it and ask it to tell me. I have to type it in. Tell me how to say this. So she has heard me. And the first name is the hardest. And by the way, what is interesting in this verse, he has a nickname. The nickname is a much easier for us to figure it out. So let's read verse 8. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joshibaseth. 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 Say that a hundred times and see what happens. It'll be in your mind. You can't forget it. Joshibashibeth. It's better when you say it fast. Nobody knows you're making a mistake. Joshibashibeth. 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 God's people will return. For God has adorned them. God's people will return. Because God's people has adorned them. Not ordained them. Adorn them. Now that's a name. He's the Tachmonite. The Tachmonite. Not a Mennonite. A Tachmonite. Nobody knows what that is. At least I can't find it anywhere. They'll give you these various things, but nobody seems to know what a Tachmonite is. But that's what he is. That's what Josheba Shebeth is. He's a chief among the captains. He was called, his nickname, a dino. Now, a dino I can remember. That's a lot easier to say. A dino. Not a dino. A dino. A dino. A dino. And you know what a dino means? Adorned. Which is very similar. He is, he is adorned. God has adorned him. In other words, God has lifted him up and put a ribbon around his neck and say, I want you to look at this man. I want you to look at a dino. Well, his, his, he has a very short verse. He's a dino of the Ezanite. You know what Ezanite means? The one who uses the spear. What's in verse 7? How do you handle thorns? With iron and spears. In other words, you, you, you handle them from a distance. Now, a dino is known as the Ezanite, one who handles the spear. Well, what does he do with his spear? Because he had killed 800 men at one time. Now, let that sink in. 800 men at one time. Let's say that he kills 80 in an hour. How many hours is he going to be out there battling? This one time, this is one event, one battle at one time, he kills 800 men. If he killed 80 in an hour, that's what? 10 hours. If he killed 100 in an hour, that's 8 hours. Do you think you could do battle hand to hand fighting with a spear for 8 hours at a time? 
This man was strong and physically strong. He had his power and might. He didn't run. Everybody else retreats, as you're going to find out in all of the other battles. Everybody else leaves. These mighty men, all of them have one thing in common. They never, ever quit. None of them. They never quit. They never retreat. They never surrender. That's not in their vocabulary. Those of you that have been with, in marriage counseling with me, whether premarital counseling or marital counseling, you will know quickly that from the time I met my wife, with our past, our parents' past, and her past, there was an agreement before we ever got married. Neither one of us will ever, ever use the D word. We will never allow the word divorce to ever even come to our mouth, much comes out. It's not an option. Now, if divorce is not an option, then guess what? You better get yourself in line. Now, it is true. You don't have control what other persons do. But you're fully responsible for what you do. My brother will remember as a little boy we would sit on the steps of the basement in Lockport, Illinois with my mom and dad fighting in the kitchen yelling and screaming and the D word the divorce word was going all over the place and it seemed to be so much we would hug each other and cry we would make plans I would make plans with my friends that we would run down to Joliet and catch that train and go wherever it was taking us my wife grew up in the same kind of situation and when we started dating, it was uh, we shared. Never going to be a word. We're never going to use it, which means I got to be the right man. I can't be a mighty man who rules and lives well if I'm a quitter, if I'm a giver-upper, if I'm not going to fight. I have no business rehearsing the sins of my mate. Never in order to justify my lack of action or my action. You're not, let me tell you something. I've probably been talking to too many people this week, so you're about to get a dump truck load right now. I don't sit often. When I sit, when, what am I telling you when I sit? You better hear. I do not, nor do I have the right, define integrity. by the promises that I keep to men. No promise that I make to any man or woman is ever, ever to be placed above the promise that I made to that woman. No promise that I ever make to any man or woman should be ever placed above the promise that I made to her and to my God. A man of integrity and other men who define men of integrity by the way, they always keep their promises to others is greatly flawed. Because many of those men put their wives after other men. Many of those men 
take the first commitment and covenant that they made before God and they make it second in order to keep a deadline or another promise that they made to someone that they don't live to. Let me tell you something. If you define yourself as a man of integrity by the promises you make to other men and women, then you will be easily able to keep that promise. And you will fit that definition. You need to understand that in God's eyes, your promise to your mate, as far as he's concerned, some promises you should have never made if you're going to put someone else above them. You understand that. When you're constantly in the habit of trying to be a man of integrity by keeping all of your promises, but you are failing to keep your primary promise, then you are not leading mightily. You're leading worldly. Because that is the world's definition of integrity. And don't be surprised when your mate feels like they're always last. And starts looking for someone to make them what God intended for you to make them. You understand? Mighty men. rule mightily but mighty men rule mightily because they know they don't can't do it alone I can't have a mighty marriage by myself you know what's interesting after David's last words, God's put, God, God puts more emphasis on the deeds of his mighty men than he does on David. And I'm telling you, every mighty marriage It's not always the one that you're always seeing that's the mighty one. Eight hundred men. I have sat here. I've tried. I've gone through all the math, the different hours and everything. I, I just can't imagine. I mean, he's not pulling a trigger or pulling, pushing a button. This man's out there with a spear. He's running people through, jerking back and forth. I told Trish, the only way I can imagine it, it's like, a, it's like my chainsaw or, the, or a, my old push lawnmower where you got this cord, you pull it up, and the thing just starts going around. Here he is with a spear, and God just pulls his cord, and he just goes, and they're just running at him, and he just, he just slaying them. That's the only way I can imagine that in one moment he can kill 800 men. <laughs> and he kills 800 men. He's, co- he's got to be covered with blood, but it's not his. What's his name? Which one are you going to use? A nickname. A dino. Joshi Ba Shebeth. And God's people were returned. You know what that means? When he's done battling, it's safe to come home. Is it like that in your home? Honestly. Is it like that in your home? When you're done battling the enemy, is it safe for the rest of your family to come home? Or do you leave an enemy in the closet or someplace? 
When you're done battling, is it safe for your children, your wife, your husband to come home? Or is there still danger around them? In one day, in one event, this man, a dino, the spear holder, kills 800. He does not retreat. He is outnumbered 800 to 1. Well, I'm not going to get through all of them. Not even all that I wanted. We'll do the next one, though. Verse 9. And after him was Eleazar. You can say that one. Eleazar is found several times. In fact, it's also a place. Eleazar means God is my helper. Eleazar, God's helper. He's the son of Dodo, not a bird. Son of Dodo, the Ahoahite. The Ahoahite. One of the mighty men, three mighty men with David. In other words, Eleazar has been mighty in his blood. His dad was a mighty man. His dad was a captain, actually. When you go to Chronicles, his dad was a captain in David's army. Eleazar is just doing what his dad does. And the emphasis again is on what? On God. God is his helper. Well, what does Eleazar do? When the... When, they defied, when, they, when David defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, the men of Israel, what? Retreated. All the other soldiers retreat. But what does Eleazar do? He arose. He attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to plunder they left him in the middle of the battle and he fights he fights and look at the language the enemy comes the people of God flee they retreat the enemy comes Eleazar looks at everybody else running and he what he arises he stands tall and he attacks, which means he moves forward. When everybody else is going away, he is moving towards the enemy. He has a sword. He holds on to that sword and uses it so much that when the battle is over, he is, his arm is, his hand is frozen to the sword. He can't let go. When all others flee, he advances. Well, which one describes you? Do you find yourself backing up? Are you self-questioning? Are you tired of this marriage thing? Are you tired of this family thing? Are you tired of the Christian thing? Are you like most? When the enemy comes, you hide. And once again, Eleazar is by himself in a field with the enemy. We don't know how many he kills. We don't know what's going on. We just know that he fights so long and so hard that when the, when the last one is dead, he can't let go of the sword. He's held it so long. I talked to an individual this week. An individual that knows that this is the word, the sword of God. But because of a situation in their life, they've laid the sword aside because they've got a whole bunch of other people speaking to them, telling them, you're justified. You're justified. You're justified. And with everyone that keeps saying justified, he gets farther and farther and farther from the sword. He's laid it down. You will not 
defeat the enemy on your own without the sword. Praise team, come on. I'm glad you need to hear me. I'm glad I am not defined by my preaching. Because I know there are times when you wonder where's the grace. But I do hope that you find me doing my very best to live by what I preach and teach. If you turn your back to the enemy, do not be surprised if you are not harmed. Or if you don't be surprised if you are harmed. Everybody else around you may flee. But you can't do that. And not have victory. What's interesting is after Eleazar slaughters this army of Philistines, the other army comes to rob the dead. And isn't that the case? You see, most people who call themselves Christians live their life robbing the dead. You know why? Because they spend most of their life running and letting someone else do their battles. David knew how to rule mightily but he also knew that to rule mildly, he didn't have to do it alone. Making it today as a husband and wife, raising children today, being a holy, godly church today is hard. The enemy is advancing on us in a full trot. And the enemy is fully armed. And he's catching us out for a walk or on a picnic. Thursday night was incredible. The men gathered filled that room literally filled that room the men prayed for one another and for, for you for other men several have asked me when are we going to do that again I don't know we did it then because I really felt like we needed to do it then when we do it again it will be because I feel like we really need to do it again now here's the thing None of you should have to fight the army, the enemy, alone. I don't know how many mighty men we have. David had thousands to choose from and could only find 37. Not all those who think they are mighty are mighty. Because some define integrity different ways. Worldly definition. Some define mighty in a worldly way as well. Some of you. You 
you've let words come out of here that should never come out of there but they're there because they're in here and some of you have dropped your sword some of you have not picked it up you know how you handle thorns with iron and spears Father, I pray that this message would be a strong sword in your hand, piercing the heart. That you would raise up an army of men and women who know the, set, the six things that David knows. They will find themselves not alone. But they won't have any problem fighting alone if they have to. And they will know victory when they do. For those that are just robbers of the dead then awaken and stir Lord speak hope into our this church these people you have given me speak hope grant courage Give them words right now that you, that you are waiting to hear from them. And may they declare their words to you now. It's in Jesus' name we pray.